Hello, my name is Bradley, and trust me, Google, Facebook, and Instagram already know this. And today, I'm going to be telling you everything they know about me, and also how they use this information to get me to buy things like, I don't know, cheese and gym memberships. But first of all, let's tap into the origins of targeted advertising. Now, the picture you see on screen is the 1908 Ford Model T, this was a car that put millions upon millions of Americans behind the wheel for the first time. Now, by 1927, Ford's factories had produced over 15 million Model Ts. Now, that's 30 times more than Tesla produced last year. Needless to say, the Model T was a genuine revolution, not just for the automotive industry, but for advertising as well. Henry Ford actually once said, if you've got a really good thing, it will advertise itself. So that's why, up until 1923, Ford hadn't invested a single dime in advertising the Model T. Yet still, Ford did supply its dealers with all sorts of informational materials and brochures. Now indeed, it was the dealers who did all of the PR work. For instance, the dealers would actually work with local newspapers and magazines to tailor advertisements to the needs of their local clients, who they knew much better than the Ford company. In fact, dealers would spend up to $3 million a year on this sort of advertising. And bear in mind, this is the 1920s, so this was an absolutely ludicrous budget for the time. Nonetheless, this approach proved successful. And by 1918, every second car in the country was a Ford Model T. Have you seen this banner before? It's horrible, isn't it? But the funny thing is, this is the first and probably the most effective banner in the history of the internet. On October the 27th, 1994, thousands of people visiting the site hotwired.com saw that banner, and 44% of them actually clicked on it, landing them on the AT&T website. You will, and the company that'll bring it to you, AT&T. By comparison, today, a banner is considered successful if it's clicked on by five users out of a thousand. Now, in marketing, this ratio is actually called the CTR, which effectively refers to the number of clicks on your link compared to the number of impressions it makes. But why have banner ads suddenly gone away? I mean, you don't really see them anymore. Well, simple. There were just too many of them. You see, that fateful AT&T banner triggered an epidemic. And within a few years, banners appeared on the vast majority of websites. In fact, there were so many banners that we could no longer distinguish between them. Now, renowned usability expert Jacob Nielsen called this the NASCAR effect. There's a good reason why. Take a look at this. There are so many different sponsors on the race cars that they all merge into a single, indistinguishable mess of logos and symbols. Now, we can easily distinguish between the cars, but we can't actually discern the individual brands themselves. Now, the thing is, because advertising at these races is so expensive, sponsors are willing to be present even if it means they cover just a tiny silver patch on the race car itself. With banner ads, the opposite actually occurred. At first, banners were placed manually on the websites, but then soon enough, so-called banner networks came along and they served as intermediaries. Now, these were effectively ad exchange systems. In other words, if you showed someone else's banner on your site, you then had the opportunity to show your banner on their site. And moreover, you could configure things like the location and the themes of the sites where your banner was actually shown. Now, in a way, it's quite similar to how Ford dealerships used local newspapers for advertising. They couldn't tell exactly who would be seeing the ads, but they could assume the interests and the needs of the readership. Anyhow, the banner craze led to networks and site owners trying to show as many of them as possible. And in turn, well, we internet users adapted. Slowly but surely, banner ads became something that we would instinctively ignore. Obviously, it didn't take long for ad agencies to see the huge potential in online promotion. Now, just five years after the first banner ads appeared, a man named Bill Gross patented a revolutionary technology. Now, his idea was to show ads that relate to the web page on which they're shown. Soon enough, this technology was actually purchased by the then leading search engine, Yahoo. Bill Gross's invention led to the emergence of an even more tailored type of advertisement, 
one that's based on your search engine queries. On the one hand, this can be seen as a good thing, right? I mean, it will be easier for you to find the information that you need. For example, if you're a Texan looking for a place to fix your car, you're not going to be bombarded with ads showing repair shops in Alaska. Now, at the same time, your web browsing history is being saved, which means that the search engine delivers advertisements based on your previous search history. So once again, we're faced with this choice between comfort on the one hand and privacy on the other. If you want to retain your privacy while searching the web, I actually recommend using a search engine that doesn't save your search history. DuckDuckGo is actually an option here. You might have heard of this one. Now, the engine is based on the idea that the user needs to be given access to as much information as possible. Therefore, the user can decide for themselves, based on non-targeted, relatively objective search results, what they want to buy. And as such, the search engine does not store web browsing history, cookies, or any other tracking data. So I'd like to conduct a little bit of an experiment. Now, we're going to enter something into Google, and then we'll enter the same thing into DuckDuckGo and compare the results. So let's enter something simple like car repair. This goes with our earlier example. Now you can see that it automatically knows I'm in London. I'm getting recommendations very specific to the place that I am. Okay, so you can see I've got some recommendations here. So it's clear that Google already knows where I am, not just the fact that I'm in London, but also the fact that we're in central London. But let's enter the same thing into DuckDuckGo. Let's go for car repair. Now you can see you actually have the choice. So you can choose where you want to search, in the United Kingdom, or is it all regions, right? Or is it Argentina or Belgium or Brazil, something like that? And you can actually go and you can get very general objective search results. So it's not storing any data about me, which is brilliant for privacy. 4.5 billion people already use the internet and the total traffic has exceeded 40 zettabytes. In other words, that is a ton of data. Too much data for my comprehending, right? Now, for example, if I wanted to search the word banner on Google, right, it's clear that I get over 2 billion results. Now, this is why search engines use something called a filter bubble mechanism. Now, this means that the search engine displays the results it thinks are suitable for me, and this is informed by the data that it's constantly collecting. Now, this includes my search history, my website visits, videos that I viewed on YouTube, and, and so on. Do you want to have a look at what Google thinks about you? Well, it's really easy. I mean, click the link in the description and you'll see yourself through the eyes of the search engine itself. Major search engines can still collect information about your interests, even if you don't click on the search results directly. And instead, you might opt to enter the URLs into the search bar. So how does this happen? Well, it's pretty simple. For instance, Google offers a convenient tool for websites called Google Analytics. Now, this effectively offers easy to use reports about visitors, popular and unpopular pages, and ultimately how users are navigating the site in general. While the site owner can't track the individual visitors, Google can. In fact, Google can track what you do, and it can also store the relevant data in your personal profile. So the more time you spend on websites that use Google Analytics, the more accurate your digital profile will be. And this means that Google can point more and more targeted ads towards you. Online stores spend a lot of time and money to get you to click on their ads, obviously, but according to statistics, most people who click on their link will actually leave after just visiting one page. This could be because of a lot of reasons. I mean, maybe they haven't yet decided to make a purchase, or maybe they don't have enough time to place an order, or even enough money in their account. In any case, they're still known as hot customers because they've already shown their interest in the product. Now, if this is you, advertisers are gonna be targeting you again and again in an attempt to make you complete that purchase, which you didn't do prior. So if you've ever clicked on an ad and then found yourself being bombarded by similar ads or the same ad over and over again, you're effectively being retargeted by these advertisers. They've captured your interest and now they're pushing you to buy. Now, it's not only search engines that are collecting your personal data. Social networks, messengers, and mobile apps collect information on your location, activities, and even the contacts of your acquaintances. Now, oftentimes, it doesn't even occur to us that we're being spied on. Now, what do likes tell us? I'm talking about the sort of likes when you go on Instagram and you like a post or on Facebook, right? Now, even a few likes can reveal your gender and age. For example, this little research project, Let's have a look. You can tick the six photos that you like more than the others. And believe it or not, 
a neural network will actually determine your age and your gender based on your selections. How mad is that? So if just six likes makes this possible, can you even imagine what Facebook and Instagram already know about you? Much too much, too much, too much, too much. Recently, Signal Messenger launched an ad campaign in which they use narrowly targeted ads based on job details, geolocation, relationship status, and personal interests. Now, these ads reveal to users just how much is known about them to advertisers, and the result is kind of creepy. You probably remember one of my recent videos where I explained how you can delete your social media profiles. If you didn't get a chance to, don't worry, go have a look after this video, it's really great. But I would like to now expand on a few of those points that I made. Well, what I'm talking about is that Facebook knows much more about you than what it reveals. And what I'm talking about is specifically the creation of a shadow profile. Now, in other words, this is a vast amount of personal information that's indirectly collected from you by Facebook. Now, what's quite scary is that you don't actually need to have Facebook to have a shadow profile created for you. All it takes is for your friends to share your contact with Facebook. Now remember, Facebook asked you to access your contacts so it can find friends quickly. Well, if you answered yes to that question, then your address book content was made available to the network, including phone numbers, email addresses, and all the information connected to people on your phone book who have never actually directly shared this information with Facebook at all. So here's my advice. Never share your contacts with Facebook, even if you've got nothing to hide, because your friends might. We had a good discussion yesterday. Now the good news is that it's actually quite easy to restrict applications on your phone by managing permissions in the settings. Now, it gets a bit more complicated with websites, however, because on websites, these settings are often hidden in the depths of the interface. That's why I recommend using aggregators like Simple Opt Out. These can disable personal data collection as you surf the web. So let's wrap it up. Hopefully, I've illustrated how invasive the advanced targeted advertising technologies have become. So maybe this will give you something to think about next time you make that unexpected online purchase. Guys, look, the key to keeping your personal information personal is meeting people in real life. Go to a bar, have a drink with your mates. Don't talk to them on Facebook or share their contact details with Facebook. It's just an invasion of privacy. Anyway, my name's Bradley, and this is SumSub. We'll see you in the next video.